In Mexican, the overlaid drawing consists of two linear configurations. One winds around two of the white quadrilaterals and back on itself. The second outlines three sides of the white rectangle at the upper right. As it turns back and over itself, the first figure creates an illusion of space mapping out a path through the delicate blue and blue-green painted ground. It rises out of and above the picture surface and sinks back again. The three white forms, on the other hand, are solid. They anchor the lines and stabilize the composition, acting as equivalents for the thick walls of Aztec pyramid temples. Joseph and Annie continued to find new inspiration in the art of Mexico and returned there again and again through the 1940s and somewhat less frequently after they left Black Mountain College in 1949. In 1941, Joseph paid tribute to his beloved Monte Alban in a drawing that relied on precise and unmodulated horizontal and vertical lines to inflect the flat surface of the page. Um, and again, juxtaposed with that photograph, um, it all seems perfectly clear to us, I hope. Um, characteristically, Monte Alban led to a series of graphic tectonics, um, and there is one upstairs in the exhibition if you want to look at these more closely, um, so-called to emphasize Albers's intention of creating architectural space purely by manipulating the thickness of a line. Albers wrote that in these works, solid volume shifts to open space and open space to volume. Likewise, Upward acts also as downward, forwards as backwards, and verticals as horizontals. Um, very interesting in relation to some of Ligia Clark's statements about space and inside and outside and so on. Um, what also sort of amused me was that the forms could be would be adapted later by Antonio Malouf in his poster for the first Sao Paulo Biennale in 1951, and I found this was quite an intriguing um, use. Uh, now, Albers didn't discover Mexico, of course, nor was he the first to feed off its rich diet of visual stimulants. But at a time of transition in his work, it supplied the ingredients to transform his work in sometimes surprising ways. When it's called Mexican, it has something to do with the snakes on the very small pyramid near to Mexico City, Tenayuca. That reminds me of Tenayuca, he told an interviewer in 1967 when looking at one of his paintings. Albers photographed the pyramid temple of Tenayuca and its intriguing and strangely abstracted stone serpents with their squared off heads and tails and bodies made of stone mosaics from every conceivable viewpoint. Then he grappled with translating his fascination with this place into his own vocabulary of form. Um, and again, I have some details of these pictures and it's the most marvelous site. It's right outside Mexico City. Nobody ever goes there. Mexicans didn't even know where it was. Um, it's just outside the boundaries of the Distrito Federale. Um, it is maintained, but when I was there first five years ago, this, I didn't recognize this piece because the stone has all crumbled and it no longer has this form, in fact, which we'll see was quite significant for Albers. But I think it's also really fascinating, the, the angles and the perspectives that he took. And of course, again, uh, today you can walk around the outside, but you can't climb all over the thing. But obviously, he was, was able to do that. So he would manage to get these amazing photographs. Um, and there we have, again, these serpent forms uh, and then this sort of, you know, interesting linear, say this computer keeps getting in the way. Uh, configuration. So uh, how does he absorb this into his own work? Um, sorry about that. 
in a series of untitled paintings on paper, which I puzzled over for months before I realized that they evoke the patterns embedded in the stone mosaics of the serpent's bodies, and that these are the heads and tails, and this, which I kept thinking was a harlequin because I'd just been studying Picasso and I'd been looking at his 1936 harlequin in the Museum of Modern Art and kept wanting to turn this you know, through 90 degrees and make it into a harlequin, but then I suddenly realized, no, these were the serpents. Um, so this was one of his translations, and then um, in a series called Tanayuka, rather directly, um, a scheme sketched first in drawings on graph paper and then developed into a group of paintings, Albers created a dynamic form that refuses to be flattened into its two-dimensional straitjacket. And I think that, again, particularly in this and this uh, configuration, we just by moving this horizontal line down a bit, suddenly this pops up as the head of the serpent, and this is the body and the tail, I hope this is convincing. Um, and once you've seen it like that, you'll never again see it as flat. Um, and these were the works that he, in fact, uh, did concede were related to the serpent. So I think it makes um, absolute sense. Uh, so we see how he takes that space. He takes this inspiration. He takes this geometry. And he then makes it into his own geometry. The spaces of Mesoamerica seem to confirm for Albers the primacy of space in his work. And during the 1930s and 40s, he curbed the attraction of color as he explored space in solid, overlapping, and intertwining blocks of black, white, and gray. Lines are now abandoned for boundaries and edges that put the surface into spatial play. In works like Bent Black of 1940 and its related studies, the references to actual places now recedes and Albus focuses on space itself as the subject. By 1950, his experience of the spaces of early Mesoamerica had brought Albus's invention to a point of resolution and he had begun his homage to the square series, which would soon become his signature work. The very title indicates a turning away from the elusive references to Mexico and towards the neutral, non-referential square. And interestingly, the earliest squares were also in black, white, and gray, not in color. Space became an almost obsessive preoccupation in the late 1940s and 50s. Hundreds of pencil sketches, pen and ink drawings, and printed and embossed graphics spawned the series of engraved vinyl and formica panels that he called structural constellations. These radical works have been understudied, perhaps because they are difficult to classify and appear mathematical and scientific an interpretation that Albers disavowed, uh, saying uh, to uh, Elaine de Kooning in Art News, reported in Art News in November 1950, uh, science aims at solving the problems of life, whereas art depends on unsolved problems, he told de Kooning, uh, who was one of the first to write about these works. Uh, and she drew attention in this article to Albers' rejection of traditional methods as he described his practice as no smock, no skylight, no studio, no palette, no easel, no brushes, no medium, no canvas, no variations in texture, no personal handwriting, no stylization, no tricks, no twinkling of the eye, I want to make my work as neutral as possible. He might have ha added, no frame, no paint, no pencil, 